Last few weeks, as we've been talking about Paul, as he's uh, talking to the Corinthians, he was sharing with the Corinthians a little of the foundational problems that they were having. And first was an issue of when their mind was right, but their heart was wrong. And then he addressed the issue of when their heart was right, but their mind was wrong. Kind of either way is problematic. And then he took a look at his own life. And in this context, he was basically sharing where he was at now in Christ. But we also looked back to see when Paul had a a heart that was right, but a mind that was wrong. But Christ had transformed him had made a difference in his life. Now Paul is saved. He's following Christ. He has the Holy Spirit speaking into him and his heart is right. His mind was right. And that all came together to create within Paul what we will call a soul winner. Paul was a soul winner for Jesus Christ. And in all of that, he dealt with some issues that they were asking. And he said, you know, sometimes, guys, it's better to opt out of all of your rights or what you think you're entitled to. It's better to opt out of that for the grace of bringing someone else to Christ. And so today, as we go into our passage, we're going to be in the same conversation still Um, But what we're going to see is that in the path of a soul winner, there is a prize and there's an escape hatch. We're going to be talking about those two things in particular. So do we have my, uh, can you, Drake, can you bring up my keynote up there possibly? Okay. So let's pray guys while Drake is doing that. Lord Jesus... I pray that you would speak. Speak through your word, Lord, into my heart, into my mind. And I pray that for all of us. Pray into us, Lord Jesus, that uh, we would understand, that you'd give us clarity, give us purpose on this journey that you have given us. Help us to see clearly your calling, Lord, for each of us as individuals and as a church family. Knowing, Lord, that we are all called to certain things and then you call each of us really to use our own unique gifts and individual gifts and personalities and talents. Uh, So, Lord, help us to see your way for us. And Lord, I pray too for our search committee as we'll be gathering together real soon to start searching um, and looking and seeing what you would have for Cornerstone in the future. And so we pray for you, Lord Jesus, to bring the person that you know we need. And Lord, also that we would be a blessing to them. Father, I pray that we would have a heart to win souls in our community. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, let me tell you about Corey. Corey was a friend of mine that I went to high school with. Uh, Corey sometimes led me in probably not the best paths always, but he was a really good guy. A lot of fun, enjoyable, funny, had a really nice cutlass, like that car, right? And then he had the Mustang uh, 5.0 saline for those of you who know cars. All right, nice cars. You know, he was uh, he was into music and stuff, so we had things in common. Um, fun, fun guy. But Corey also, uh, yeah, he, he was a partier. He dabbled in drugs. Um, he had some areas in his life that uh, that I saw that I just thought, boy, this guy... This guy needs Jesus. You know, now now that I'm a little bit older and I look back, I realize, huh, my sins weren't any better than his. <laughs> Although at the time, I probably thought of myself as being more godly, you know, put on that self-righteousness. 
his sins weren't any worse than mine. Well, after high school, uh, I spent about a year going to uh, community college before I moved up to Crown College or St. Paul Bible College at the time. And it was on one of my excursions coming back home to Ocheedon to get some stuff. And then I was, I was kind of still moving some things. And I had driven over to Sibley, Iowa, and I had pulled in to get gas at the general store, probably at about 89 cents a gallon at the time. Uh, the general store, now, now that's a play on words if you're from Sibley because we were the Sibley generals. So the general store was with our mascot, see? See, we were the Sibley generals. Well, I'm getting gas there, and who should pull in? But Corey pulls in, and so we're talking a little bit. And as I'm talking to him, I just feel this tugging on my heart uh, for his soul. But I feel like the Lord's saying, invite him along. Invite him to go with you up, because I knew it was only going to be up to, up to the school for a couple of days. And I feel like God's saying, invite him along. And now, Corey and I were acquaintances in high school. We weren't real close. We got along okay, but... I was actually, I, you know, I'm, I'm that, I'm a little bit on that introvert side. So I, I was actually scared to ask him if he wanted to go, okay? But there's a burden on my heart for him. And I wanted to be able to share with him what Christ had been doing in my life because I was growing, still not there, still not arrived, still making mistakes, but Christ had been working on me. So I said, hey, you want to go along with me? I got I to gotta drive some stuff back up to college, be up there a couple days, and then I'll come back. And he said, sure. I was like, oh, didn't expect that. And so for the next three and a half hours, I'm doing a couple of different things. One, we're having conversation. I'm talking about Christ. We're listening to cassette tapes of different Christian speakers on our way up there. And we talked late into the night and it was about three o'clock in the morning or so. We're in my dorm room when Corey prayed and asked Jesus Christ to be a part of his life. And that was pretty incredible. And that now bonded us in some new ways. But as time goes on and about five years go, goes by, five years or so goes by and he starts slipping into some of the old, the old ways, doing some of the old things. And I kind of notice that, you know, when I get together with him now, I kind of feel like maybe he's influencing me more than I'm influencing him. And so we started to drift apart a little bit. Now, we, we stayed friends. We would talk to each other once in a while. He would call when something big had happened or something not so good was going on, and we'd talk. Um, and so we slowly drifted apart because we were kind of going two different directions. But my heart ached for him to know what it's like to walk closely with Christ the way I knew it could be. Well, about six months ago, it was right after Ryan passed away, actually, Corey called me and he just said, Steve, I've done it. I'm all in. Jesus has me. I am so sick of listening to the things I listen to. I'm so sick of living the way I've lived. He's got me. And it's, he's like, I cannot walk away again. I'm all in. He's like, and he starts talking to me, telling me about what Christ has been doing in his life. And, uh, you know, he just, he says, when I die now, I know where I'm going to be. And I want, I want people to remember me for being somebody that followed Jesus. I want my kids to know that I follow Christ. I want to leave a legacy. You know, and he's found a church. His sophomore son is going to church with him. Um, his wife and daughter at this point are, are not. And you can be praying for that whole situation. Um, but now he calls every two weeks or so just to let me know how wonderful his walk with Christ has been. And that is so good for my heart. You see, I like that guy. And I get to see him in heaven. 
we'll probably look at each other and shake our heads and say, I can't believe that that was us way back then. But guys, I get to be with him for eternity and know that he's in heaven. And it, it really it came down to the Lord putting on my heart this, just this tug. And, and, and guys, I didn't save him. The Holy Spirit did. Um, but that does my heart a lot of good to know where he's at right now. And so it's so fun when he's calling now and just sharing with me these things. So it's so, so good. My question for you is, does your heart ache for someone else's soul? As we read what Paul is going to share with us today, and you read these passages, I don't think anything else really mattered to Paul. He really didn't care about anything else in this world except for the souls of others. So I want to ask this question, and it's around this one phrase that he says that we talked about last week a little bit. But remember, he says, run in such a way to win the prize. Okay, run in such a way to win the prize. Right now, what I want you to do is take your bulletin. If you got a pen, write down, what is your answer? What is the prize? Take a moment, write that down. And if you're too stubborn to take out your bulletin and write it down, then put it in your head and write it down in your head. Final answer. Remember who wants to be a millionaire? Final answer. What's the prize? Okay, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. One of our elders or deacons will get one to you. We're in 1 Corinthians 9. Verse 19, and we're going to go through 10, verse 16. So Paul writes, Although I'm a free man and not anyone's slave, I made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like Jews to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law to win those under the law. To those who are without that law, like one without the law, not being without God's law, but within Christ's law to win those without the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. Now I do all this because of the gospel so I may become a partner in its benefits. Don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives a prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control and everything. However, they do it to receive a crown that will fade away. But we, a crown that will never fade away. Therefore, I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Okay, chapter 10, verse 1. Now I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But God was not pleased with most of them, for they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things became examples for us, so that we will not desire evil things as they did. Don't become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to play. Let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in a single day, 23,000 people fell dead. Let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. Nor should we complain as some of them did and they were killed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as examples and they were written as a warning to us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. 
God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I am speaking as, a, as to wise people. Judge for yourself what I say. The cup of blessing that we give thanks for, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? All right, we're going to take this section in two parts. Two main points that I want to draw attention to are the prize that Paul speaks of and the escape. So the prize. All right, pull out your answer. Look at your answer. What is the prize? Now, if you wrote, well, the prize is eternal life with Jesus, I would say, yeah, I affirm that. However, there's a but here. I do affirm that that is a prize. And yes, eternal life is a prize. But is that all really what Paul is speaking of here? If we ask that question, do we earn salvation? Do I run the race to earn salvation? So if the prize is eternity and I'm running the race to win the prize, am I earning salvation? Well, Scripture says no. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift. It's not of yourselves. You don't earn salvation, do you? All of a sudden, if we say, well, the prize is eternity, the prize is for me to be able to go to heaven, so I'm going to run so that I can go to heaven, that's works-based salvation. Is that what that's talking about? See, I just threw you for a loop, didn't I? See, we're on a really, we're on a, we're on a slippery slope of theological mayhem if we start talking like we are somehow earning our salvation, or earning eternity. Let's look back over chapter 9, 19 through 27. I want you to do so with a fresh set of eyes. Here's what I want you to do. Every time you hear the word win, underline it. If you're not an underliner, make note of it. Okay? Listen to this. Paul said, although I'm a free man, not anyone's slave, I made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, not being without God's law, but within Christ's law, what? To win those without the law. To the weak, I become weak. Why? Why, Paul? In order to win the weak. I've become all things to all people so that I may have by every possible means save, and I would put parentheses, win some. Now I do all this because of the gospel so I may become a partner in its benefits. The very next verse, run in such a way to win the prize. Why do we read basically six times, five clear, one inferred, win win, 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 win souls. So I'm going to run to win the prize and all of a sudden we think the prize is my, my personal eternity. The prize in this context includes the souls of others. What's the prize? In context, it's bringing others to Christ Jesus. There's the prize. And then it goes on, as you read, uh, get down to verse 25. Now everyone who competes exercises self-control and everything, however they do it, to receive a crown that's going to fade away. But we, we're doing it to receive a crown that will never fade away. Right? See guys, Paul already has the prize of eternal life. He's got that prize. The race he is running is a race to save souls. So yes, it's about salvation. Yes, it's about eternity. But he's trying to win people to Christ. He is a soul winner. 
Then he says, instead, I discipline my body, this is verse 27, and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Now there again, he is not talking about being disqualified for heaven. He's talking about, I don't want to be disqualified. I don't want my life to stop reflecting the gospel. I don't want to be disqualified from people looking at me and seeing Jesus. I don't want to be disqualified. Context is so important. I know that many people use this verse, run as to win the prize, and what they're thinking is, I want to live my life so well that I'm going to get heaven, Christ. And, and I get that thinking, but no, you know what? We've got heaven because of Christ. Now run in a way that brings them honor. I'm not doing it to earn my place in heaven. And in running, in, in, in striving, I'm doing to bring more people to Jesus Christ. Context, it's important. Yes, eternity is a prize. And the thought of that is included. The crown, in the greater context of all of scripture, the crown is spoken of as righteousness. Whose righteousness? Jesus. His righteousness is given to us. His righteousness it's, it speaks of it as eternal life, which is from Jesus. It's glorification, which is from Jesus. And yet in this context, the souls of others have to be considered as part of the crown because that's the context of what Paul is speaking of. I am striving to, to a Jew, I, I want to win Jews. To the Greek, I want to win the Greek. To the weak, I want to win the weak. I'm going to run in a way to win the prize, right? So five times he says that he's striving to win souls and then he says to save some. Does that challenge how you've maybe thought about that verse before? Run in such a way as to win the prize. Have you ever thought about this? That part of what your crown in heaven is are the souls that the Holy Spirit influenced through your life, the people that were influenced by you for Christ, that's part of your crown? Does that motivate you differently? When you realize that your crown includes the lives that were blessed by Christ working through you. Now let's be very clear again. I don't save anybody personally. However, the Holy Spirit as he redeems and renews and regenerates, the Holy Spirit will use the hands and feet and mouth of his people to speak truth into others and to draw them in. And this is what Paul, when he's saying, I get to partner in its benefits. Paul's not the one that saves people. The Holy Spirit is. But Paul gets to partner in the benefits of it. So, does that change the way you look at what it is to win the prize? See, a right heart and a right mind leads to a soul winner. And Paul says, imitate me. You see what I'm doing? Imitate me as I am imitating Christ. That's chapter 11, verse 1. So <clears throat> when I was a new believer and I'm going to a Christian college, there was one thing that I saw everywhere. And I really don't see it a whole lot anymore. Once in a while I do. But everywhere I turned, they were encouraging us to use the Romans road. Now, first off, the book of Romans, I'm trying to think, who wrote that book? Paul. Oh, oh, that makes sense, doesn't it? Paul wrote Romans. The Romans road are verses that Paul wrote being guided by the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote these certain verses and here is the Romans road if you have never seen it. So we learned these when I was in school and I, I would see them a lot then. I don't, do, do you see it very often anymore? The Romans road? Guys, now this isn't the totality of the gospel, but this is the essential of what you need to know 
to come to Jesus Christ. And if you're going to be a soul winner, this is the essentials of what people need to know to come to Christ. Part one, all, well, part one, all have sinned. They've come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, that includes me. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Romans 6.23, the wages or the cost of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So you, if you don't have these, write them down or you can, you can look them up online. Just put in the Romans road. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his love for us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our assurance of salvation is through Jesus. Now I just recommend that you get to know those things. Don't, you don't have to speak it all canned like, because basically, you know, when I was telling you about Corey, it took me about eight hours to get that across to Corey, right? Before he came to that point. At its most basic, this is the gospel. And this is the gospel that Paul brought to the Romans, the Gentiles. He brought this same message to the Jews, to the weak, to those under the law, to those not under the law. Okay. At its most basic, this is the gospel. And Paul says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Now guys, we're not all gifted with evangelism the way Paul was, right? Um, Paul is amazing. And I look at my friend Mark, who, who stands on the street corners in Minneapolis and in Guatemala and in Tokyo, Japan. And he stands there and he does these little tricks like illusions. And then he starts speaking gospel and he brings Christ, to people to Christ. I'm not gifted that way. Maybe you are, great, and you should go do that. But you know what? What I do know is God has given each and every one of us gifts and talents. And he wants you to preach out of your passions and out of who you are to bring his message, the gospel. Um, now, I'm not going to take a lot of time with this next one. Uh, go to the next slide. We're going to get here in just a moment. But here's the thing. Right after Paul talks about being a soul winner, I want to win them, I want to win them, I want to win them, he goes into this little explanation about, about uh, being tempted, falling into sin. And guys, I, I think that's really a, a spiritual intentionality of Paul because you see, when you determine and you surrender to become a soul winner and you're going to begin to speak Christ, Satan doesn't want you to do that. And he's going to start throwing temptations at you. And on this path to being a soul winner, he's going to try and derail you. And that's why it says, as it says up here, now these things happened to them as examples and they were written as a warning to us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. Now, guys, some people misquote this passage as God won't give you more than you can bear. And that's not true. God will give you more than you can bear, meaning that you need to lean into him. And that's what this passage says. You need him. You need him. And he's going to provide a way. Go to that next slide there. He's going to provide, oops, we went too far. One back. He's going to provide an escape hatch, right? And I know in my own life, there's been times where I'm like, but where's that escape hatch? I'm looking for it. I don't see it. Where is that escape hatch? What I have finally learned over the years, the escape hatch isn't a where or a what. It's remembering Jesus said, 
I am the way. Oh, it's that easy, is it? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is our escape hatch. Turning to him. When temptations are facing you, turn to him. Throw yourself at his feet. Cry out to him in prayer. Blabber if that's all you've got. But go to Jesus. Worship. Hear his words from the scripture. This is the escape hatch. When you're facing those temptations that are trying to derail you, Jesus is the escape hatch. He doesn't just point to it. He is it. Finally, I want you to just consider in verse 16 of chapter 10, there's another part here in all of this context he then goes into the cup of blessing that we give thanks for. Is it not sharing in the blood of Christ? The, Jesus is our escape. The blood of Christ is our escape. We share in the blood of Christ that forgives us. But there's two-way connection. There's this connection with him and there's a connection with others. So the escape hatch is Jesus and I believe that he provides family for accountability and working together and saying, hey, you know what, I'm struggling. Can you be praying for me? Can you come alongside me in this? And the bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Guys, I know that, that the call of Christ on us is to be a soul winner. However that looks for you as an individual. But I also know that as soon as you determine and you say in your heart, yes, Lord, send me, Satan's going to want to stop you. Uh, anybody who's a part of the Curcio weekends knows that if you're preparing for a Curcio weekend, you're being attacked, aren't you? I mean, and if you guys look around, if you haven't been to Curcio, you can see those who have been. They're going to be like, yeah. You're attacked. If you're preparing for that, you're going to be attacked. Why? Because Satan wants to stop it. But Christ, lean into him. He is our anchor and our sump pump. Right? I love that idea that Jim brought up. That's exactly what it is. Worship team, come back up. We're going to do one more song. Then if you're a member especially, please stay for our short meeting to follow. Father God, I pray that we would begin to see, as you have said and laid out in this scripture, that part of our rewards in heaven, the joy of the crown are the people that are influenced by you through us, that that gets to be a part of that. We get to share in the benefits of the joy of people coming to Christ. And Lord, sometimes I don't ache enough for the souls of others. I do ache for some, but Father, I pray that you would open my mind and my heart to see the truth of the needs that are out there. Give me a desire and a willingness to follow Paul and becoming a soul winner, Lord, that that would be a concern of ours. Knowing that there's a lot more than just giving uh, a, a few verses, but there's discipleship to take place, transformation, repentance, a walking side by side, partaking in communion, being a part of a fellowship, all of those things. Transformational. Lord, we need you. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.